I just want enough people to understand this because you save money, you're more comfortable and you're saving the planet at the same time. So actually even people who don't believe in climate change would be sensible to do this. We've said it before, we'll say it again. The UK has some of the oldest and leakiest housing stock in the world. And as energy bills continue to rise and the need to decarbonise intensifies, retrofitting properties is absolutely key. So we've come to St Albans to meet Judith Leary-Joyce to find out about her retrofitting journey of her 1901 end of terrace Victorian home and to find out how she's educating others looking to do the same. Welcome to the Everything Electric Show. We've teamed up with Duracell Energy to celebrate their brilliant ecosystem of home energy products and their Platinum Home Owner offer by giving away a Duracell Bunny. To win, simply watch to the end and answer a question about Fully Charged. We started to build on the footprint of an old conservatory. It was a fantastic family space, but it was freezing cold in the winter and too hot in the summer, so it was a waste. So we decided we would build onto that footprint and make it a usable room. Uh, so we got an eco design for the extension, we got the builder in, we started the whole thing going. And then the builder came to visit and said, I know you want an air source heat pump. This extension will be perfect for that. The rest of your house is very leaky, but it'll probably be good enough. So we spent a long night in the middle of this building site with pieces of paper and making lists and drawing plans and came out at the end saying, we're gonna make this house a legacy for the future. So broadly, what is retrofitting and why is it needed? According to the Centre for Sustainable Energy, retrofit refers to any improvement work on an existing building to improve its energy efficiency, making them easier to heat, able to retain that heat for longer, and replacing fossil fuels with renewable energy. It is widely recommended that individuals take a fabric-first approach to retrofitting their homes, which includes prioritising repairs, insulation, draft proofing and ventilation, before measures such as solar panels, batteries and heat pumps. Leaky homes due to poor insulation and drafts waste energy, whether that energy is renewable or not. And here in the UK, some 50% of homes have uninsulated walls. So we're currently stood in front of a very beautiful array of different types of insulation. I wonder if you could walk us through some of your favourite ones and some of the materials that you have here in, in this the house. house. Well, my absolute favourite has to be this one which is called Pava Textile, and it's made from old denim jeans, old cotton t-shirts and velvet. Oh my goodness. So that's lovely. We've yeah. got that above our bathroom. Uh, on these walls and the, the, the main walls in the house, then we've got um, wood fibre. And also this is a wood fibre version of plasterboard called Isolayer. This one's actually covered in lime plaster as well. This is another wood fibre, so there's lots of different ways of having wood fibre. Sheep's wool that we've got in the loft. This is expanded glass beads that you can oh have goodness. instead of concrete. And we've got those in our studio in the garden. And this is an interesting one that we've used in the, um, the front room. It's called diathonite and mm -hmm. that's a thermal plaster. So you can do that to any thickness. And that can, or that can go internally, but can also go on, go on external walls. Oh, wow. And it's breathable, so it's fine for an old house. And have you lost any thickness or sort of any width from your rooms because you've had to have quite thick insulation? It's, it's always the first question, people saying, oh, my house is too small, I couldn't mm. insulate on the inside. And I felt exactly the same. I thought we'd be sort of... Mm, mm, you know. <laughs> but you'll see more in the bedroom. That's where I show people actually what... Because the optimal insulation is 60 to 80 mil. Mm -hmm. We've got 100 mil everywhere. And you'll see what that looks like. Here we took the fireplace out and you can see the thickness here. So that's primarily insulation. But we could, uh -huh. we could put loads there because we'd got space from the fireplace. Fireplaces are just dirty great holes in your mm. house. So unless you really want to keep them and use your fire, ideally, if you're already back to the brick, take them out. Mm. But if you're not, then you need to find ways to block them up. But then, of course, that needs to, you need to then ventilate as well, otherwise you'll end up with dripping windows. 
So I wanted to show you what 100 mil of insulation actually looks like and the impact that it has on the room. So where the window is, that's the external wall. And where this wall is, that's the amount of insulation. And you can see it barely impacts this room at all. So this is a Victorian property, or at least started off as a Victorian end of terrace property. What are some of the things that sort of come up that people need to be aware of in this type of property? If you've got a suspended floor and it's a single brick build, then it will be a breathable system. Mm -hmm. That is the worst word <laughs> for anything around building because it's nothing to do with breathing. It's actually about being vapour permeable. Right. If you're not vapour permeable from one side to the other, then you get condensation within the wall and then eventually that'll start, the brick will start to break down. So that's the main thing that you need to know, that if you're built before 1930, it's going to have to be vapour permeable and that means everything from your external wall right through to your paint. And if you don't do that, then you'll end up with problems. So I spotted this and I have to admit at first I thought it was a bed for a, a doll for a <laughs> grandchild. Yeah. I've since discovered it is not that. No. What are we looking at? So many people ask the question, how did you insulate under the suspended floor? Mm -hmm. So this is a model of what it looks like when you lift the floorboards and you've got a suspended floor. So this, this is called the subfloor void. Mm -hmm. And at, at the wall side of this bit, you'll have the air bricks. Yeah. And you must never, ever, ever cover up the air bricks, otherwise you'll end up with damp. Yeah. So you always have to leave the air bricks, but if you don't have any insulation, then you get really cold mm -hmm. feet. So what you do then is you create, we, we use the air tightness membrane. Mm -hmm. It's uh, just stapled on here and then use it like a sling ah. to hold it. But because you've got to mind the air bricks, this was his way of doing it. That's the depth of the air bricks. Yeah. And he would work out where to fix the membrane by using his little pieces of wood. Ah. So then you're suspending your insulation above the top of the air brick, so you get the best of both worlds. You get Got warm it. feet and cold air under the floor. And then you have to cut the wood fibre individually because you'll see here, it's much narrower here than it is here, and this is that nothing is even no. in a Victorian home. Nothing is square, nothing is even. So you have to measure each one and cut it individually. So I was on cutting and he <laughs> put it in. So then you pack it in and we used Oops, I haven't got it written right. We use two layers of wood fibre. He put this in to show how never use a rigid um, insulation under a suspended floor because it's constantly moving course, very slightly. Yeah. And what you end up with is like these big gaps ah. on the side. You can't cut it as easily. When you're using wood fibre, you can cut it slightly large. Mm -hmm. So then you just shove it in yeah. and you're getting fewer air gaps. But so that's your insulation. Mm -hmm. That's your woolly jumper. Then you need your airtight jacket. So this stuff is the stickiest tape in the world. It's <laughs> uh, the version we use called Contiga tape but you use it to seal up the air tightness membrane to the wall and layers of air tightness membrane to each other. So you end up with a total seal. So over that then you put your floorboards back down and you put your skirting board down and nobody knows it's there but your feet are warm. We often on the channel talk about insulation and air tightness, less so about ventilation, which is what one of these units is. Can you walk us through your ventilation in this home? You must always have ventilation because the air tightness is cutting out the uncontrolled air, but you have to put controlled air back in. Mm -hmm. And ideally, I mean, you need to keep the heat that you so lovingly created. So the standard extractor fans that we used to in bathrooms and kitchens, just take out the stale air and bring in cold air. Mm. These are single room heat recovery units. So as the old air goes out and the fresh air comes in within the wall, 
the heat changes over. So you save 85% of your heat. Which is phenomenal because you don't want to be chucking that air no. out, just all that hard work gone. No. And the, whereas in, if you're building a passive house or a new house, you can put in a whole house system, mm -hmm. but it's got really big ducts in the ceilings and between floors to put then put air vents into each room. That's really difficult to do in an old house. Mm -hmm. So we discovered these, so you can put it in each room or wherever you need them. We started with two and then just added in more. So it's so lovely and toasty warm in, in your home. But what some people maybe don't realise when they go to an air source heat pump is that it's not like having a, a traditional gas central heating system in which you maybe put it on for an hour in the morning, an hour in the evening. Mm. It's a very different way of managing it. Where we've got the underfloor heating, that's particularly nice because you, your feet are, are very warm. But it's not like normal underfloor heating, which is quite hot. Mm -hmm. It's just steady warmth and you only actually realise it's on when you go onto a floor that isn't on. With regard to the radiators, uh, we followed the recommendation to have the bigger radiators because it's running, the air source runs at 55 and the gas runs at 65. Mm. So they say you need a bigger surface area to heat the space. So we've got big radiators. I don't think we needed them. Oh my goodness. The radiator in the front room have put on about five times mm -hmm. uh, when we've, if we've had that door closed and we want to just heat it up quickly. We've got one in the bedroom we've never switched on. And actually the house, the bulk of the time is heated on the, fl the underfloor heating in the kitchen and mm -hmm. the sitting room where we just were sitting. The towel rail in the bathroom and the towel rail in the ensuite. And that's all we have on. It's extraordinary because I suppose when, when people are sizing the system, they're thinking about how the house currently feels, but it's yeah. maybe not factoring in, you know, the amount of insulation, the amount of air tightness, the efficiency that's going to exist in that household, and therefore that you don't need to go for those, those really huge systems. Yeah, my husband's convinced we could have had a smaller heat pump. <laughs> Originally, we were recommended a 12.5 kilowatt, and then uh, when our provider realised just how much we were putting in, we've got an 8.5, mm -hmm. but we do wonder, could we have had a 6? So you obviously had a little bit of scope creep. Was there... <laughs> That's very polite. <laughs> <laughs> Just a moderate amount of scope creep. Was there also some extraordinary um, cost creep as well? So if we looked at what was the additional cost that we uh, added to do the retrofit, so that would be the insulation the uh, and all the materials, uh, the heat pump, we did add that in, the solar, and the extra labour time, it was £23,000, roughly. When you think of the benefits that we've gained yeah. from doing this, so we went, before we did the work, we were using 25,500 kilowatt hours a year. We now use less than six. Wow. So that's, I know. We yeah. have been around those numbers so often because we couldn't believe it. We were hoping for a 50% improvement, but it's 75%. Our EPC has gone from energy performance certificates gone from D to a B. Yeah. And I got, I got two estate agents in to give, they knew we weren't selling, but I said, I would like a valuation. Mm -hmm. They said, so we'll get you to do it. He priced the house at 90,000 more. So 23,000, 90,000 plus, it's a no brainer. So before we go, I have one last thing that I want to show you. Now this here might look like a very normal dishwasher, and it is a very normal dishwasher, but of course, instead of it being on the ground, it is at waist height, which means that you're not having to bend down every time you unload and load it. And I think for me, that epitomizes Judith and John's approach. They have taken normal everyday things and taken a step back and thought about how they could be implemented in a more efficient way. And that is so vital when it comes to retrofits. It's absolutely essential to take a step back, to think about things in a slightly different way so that you're not doing like for like replacements, which may not be fit for purpose. But let us know what you think in the comments. Please do like and subscribe. And if you have been, thank you for watching.
We're really excited to partner with Duracell Energy to showcase their amazing renewable energy solutions. If you want to reduce your energy bills and join the renewable energy transition, installing home battery storage and solar panels at home is a great way to start. Duracell Energy's ecosystem of products typically partners with solar panels, but they can be just as effective without it, particularly for electric vehicle owners or anyone looking to take control of their energy. And with Duracell Energy's Platinum Homeowner offer, viewers can get a custom service that pairs you with top quality products and the best installers in your area. Your installation also comes with a 20-point check, a six-month performance review, system health checks at three and 10-year periods, and outstanding local UK customer support every step of the way. Duracell Energy's batteries, inverters, and EV chargers work together on one easy-to-use app. With features like dynamic tariff integration and grid services, you'll be able to maximize your return. Ready to get started? You can get your quote today. And don't forget, we're also giving away a Duracell Energy Bunny in every episode. Just answer the question about Fully Charged by following the link in the description. Good luck.